Well, hello everyone. We're back for Theranos. This is really part three, and I'm going to take a quick timeline through the whole case study. If you want part one and part two, please go back and check this out or check this out because those are the first two full length case studies that I did on the Therano story. Today, I'm gonna to go on a fast timeline because many of you have been reaching out to me in social media saying, hey, what's up with this Theranos company that we're seeing in the news? Well, it actually started back in 2003 at Stanford and that's where we're gonna pick up the story as I take a seat and kind of narrate through the timeline. And again, if you wanna see more, go to those first two case studies, watch them back to back, then watch this timeline and you'll see this is what I call, in the words of the Brit, a bloody entrepreneur gone bad. It starts here in 2003 at Stanford University. Elizabeth Holmes, 19 years old, and she drops out to launch a blood testing company called Theranos. Now, I happen to think that this was a great idea if you could pull it off biomedically and you could really take a small drop of blood and through advanced technology, be able to do so many blood tests that take vials and vials. And we've all been there. The nurse comes in, puts a band around your arm, puts a needle in, called the butterfly, and then they take three, four, five, vials maybe just for a checkup. Well, think of the trauma on small children and stuff and what a great feat of science it would have been if we had one drop of blood that could get so many diagnoses. You could go to the back of Walgreens and give a drop of blood so quickly and get a panel so you could understand everything from cholesterol to triglycerides, which most people can easily understand and they need to know those things to monitor their diet, to more advanced things. Well, that was the dream of this woman, Elizabeth Holmes. And Elizabeth Holmes, you know, had a pretty good first year. By the end of 2004, she had raised $6.9 million. That's pretty good. And Theranos had a value of 30 million. Now think about it, why would somebody do that? Well, she's dropping out of Stanford. She's incredibly smart. She had some scientists around her. And so a $30 million valuation there in 2004 and getting six, seven million dollars in venture capital, that really wasn't that big of a jump and she's coming out of Stanford which is right next door to Sand Hill Road where all the venture capitalists that are they say the top tier of venture capitalists call those offices home well by 2007 Theranos is valued at 197 million and they raise another 42 million dollars from Investus in 2009 a very important thing happened this guy joins Theranos his name is Sonny Balwani he joins the company as the number two executive and he finds Ms. Holmes kinda hot so this old guy is dating this young girl and by the way note to everybody else I tend to lean conservative but I will exercise my Second Amendment rights if I ever have one of my daughters found a company and a guy this old s takes up with them. I would put an end to that immediately. So here we go. In 2010, now she's attached to this guy, Sonny, and they are running Theranos together. And they get another round of financing. And so 2010, about six years from the founding date, because we're going back here to 03 when she drops out, gets started in 04 with the 6.9 million. So in just a few years, this thing's worth 2010, a billion dollars. So she joins the Unicorn Club with a billion dollars and she starts thinking rather highly of herself, and she could be seen here and here on speaking tours, you know, the people impressed. She was also using this deep voice that everybody was skeptical about. What's with the deep voice? And what's with always dressing in black? Well, she started creating this persona through the deep voice, and there are many people that have heard her speak in regular feminine voices, and then have also heard her in this deep voice, and they think the deep voice is an act. And then she was trying to create this persona, was knocking down the air conditioning in the building 365 days a year to like 60, you know, six degrees, yeah, that's green. And you're dressing like Steve Jobs, and having her PR people apparently, as the story goes, if you believe all this, you know, seeding things, oh, she's a female Steve Jobs, but in the biomedical space, biotech. Uh-huh, yeah, let's see how that works. Well, guess what? We all found out that really wasn't what was going on. So anyway, 2015, the Wall Street Journal steps in. And thank God for this guy, John Kerry. John Kerry would write a book 
right here, about Theranos, but he busted the company. So in October of 2015, which is five years after the, the billion dollar valuation, and four years after this guy, George Schultz, an ex-Secretary of State of the United States, yeah, there's a medical expert, he's an expert in foreign diplomacy and comes out of the Defense Department, and he's on your board. Well, he was a big name guy that brought a lot of big name money to come along with him, including Henry Kissinger, this guy, attorney David Boyes, as well as this guy, former Wells Fargo chief executive, Richard Kovakovich. Well, you know, Wells Fargo, remember, Wells Fargo had a its own problem that I covered in a case study where they were committing fraud and opening up uh, accounts that people didn't want and didn't ask for. Uh-huh, there you go. Yeah, nice guy to have on your board considering that this company was about to be fraud central. Anyway, the valuation 2014 is up to $9 billion. And on paper, she's worth $4.5 billion because she still had approximately 50% control, ownership, and presence on what's called the cap table, which is like a pie chart that indicates how much is yours versus everybody else's. Well, she's worth four and a half billion. So now she's being paraded around as the next Steve Job, the first lady of biotech, and she's a billionaire. Well, getting back to the Wall Street Journal, all of that smelled funny and that reporter did America a service by really diving in deep into the hype and what was missing and what hadn't been proven with Theranos. So the story breaks October 15th, here it is. And on October 21st, oddly enough, speaking at this Wall Street Journal uh, conference, she stands by her company's you know, statements and technology and says that the company is entering a pause period to kind of go evaluate everything. Yeah, a pause period is sometimes called circling the wagons because the cops have arrived. Well, it wasn't quite the cops yet, but certainly the Wall Street Journal had done its part to bring inspection on a company that had raised so many hundreds of millions of dollars and now the speculation is this stuff doesn't work and more than one pharmacy chain in America had been duped and these drugstore chains were talking about putting these machines in the pharmacies in the back of their store so they could do the things that I mentioned with a drop of blood for you and me. Except there was one problem. They weren't using a drop of blood, they were taking a full vial of blood and they were using machines made by other people. In other words, the original promise, we'll take a drop of blood, put it in our machine, get all these results out that are so convenient and people like little kids won't have to get the, the big needle in the arm. It wasn't working, which is exactly the point that the Wall Street Journal was making. Now let's jump to January 2016. Gets kind of fun because the cops do arrive. The cops are in the form of these guys. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, which governs a lot of the administration of Medicare and health services here in the United States. Well, they announced that they're going to do an inspection of their lab and the results of that inspection, they found numerous deficient practices. So now it's getting worse. So they went from Theranos, oh, the Wall Street Journal, this is a bias, it's a hit piece. You know, we're making people jealous, we're causing all of this. And she goes on Jim Cramer and says, you know, hey, and Michael, what was it? Do we have that clip from Jim Cramer? Yeah, here's the clip from Jim Cramer. This is what happens when you work to change things. And First they think you're crazy, then they fight you, and then all of a sudden you change the world. And um, I, I have to say, I, I, I personally was shocked to see that the journal would publish something like this when we had sent them over a thousand pages of documentation demonstrating that the statements in their piece were false. So she had said that on Jim Cramer, so they were still in full denial mode. Meanwhile, CMS is saying that some of these deficient procedures actually represented risk to the health of people that might engage in a Theranos test. Oh, that's good. So now it, it may endanger your health and maybe there's something big going on. Well, this is why the cops exist and the cops in the forum again of CMS. They're out there to inspect facilities like Theranos and to keep you and me safe. And they announced that they even think that this was, and I'll read it, posed an immediate jeopardy to patient health and safety. I see that's a pretty big traffic ticket. That's not just a stop sign. That's like full on drunken driving while operating a company. So then in May of 2016, Sonny Bawani, you know, you know, 
Captain Humpster, the boyfriend, he was out there and he's asked to, it's a board reorganization leave. Well, it was more than a board reorganization. It's like, hey, you were partners in crime here and you have been covering for her. Your relationship overlaps everything. You're protecting each other. There's no sort of uh, checks and balances here. You out. And that was it for Sonny. However, the feds would catch up with him and he's got his own trial coming up soon. Another Netflix miniseries coming your way, I'm sure. So on October 2016, Theranos closes the lab. So if you take a look at this from October of 2015, where the Wall Street Journal broke the story appropriately, deeply, doing a service for you and me, a year later, the lab is closing down. Then, April of 2017, Arizona Attorney General announces that all Arizonans who purchase the Theranos tax can get a full refund under a $4.65 million settlement with the company. So, that little news bit you just saw there, which was also reported by the Wall Street Journal, and some of the things I'm reading here come from the journal. Thank you again for your great reporting. They actually, state of Arizona, the attorney general is like, I'm not getting in line, I'm not waiting, I'm running the head of line, and I'm suing these jerks. Well, guess what? And they got a settlement back, so Arizonans got reimbursed for the test, and you just hope that those Arizonans didn't make health decisions for elderly people themselves or their children that were made based on bad test information. Then in May of 2017, there was a lawsuit brought by Investor Partner Fund Management, PFM. They wanted their $96 million back that they gave to the company in 2014. Now, no one talks about how they settled this deal, but apparently they got some shares and they signed some papers, but they probably had to do that because some of their own investors, the people that put the money into uh, PFM, were like, what the hell, we invested in this? And they're like, hang on, we're with the lawyers, we're over there right now we're gonna see what we can get back so sometimes these suits are really to look good for your own investors and don't result in getting anything back well then in March 2018 what we're seeing unfold in San Jose happens as and I love this part the Securities Exchange Commission charges Holmes and Bowani with civil securities fraud now it's big because now the big cops have shown up. And in June of 2018, they brought the criminal fraud charges against them. Uh, July of 18, they settled with additional investors. And then in June of 2019, they set a trial date to start in 2020, mid-2020. COVID delayed all that, and the trial did not start till August 2021. Jury selection started, and as we've seen going on for the past weeks, she has been found guilty by the jury no surprise here if you were following what the witnesses were saying, what ex-employees were saying, what the investors that were upset were saying, it is no surprise whatsoever that she has been found guilty. Sayonara, we don't know where she's gonna be sentenced or if she's gonna be sentenced because she just had a baby and they're trying to use that dynamic to say maybe she's on house arrest forever or whatever, but her name and guilty are forever etched into the annals of American entrepreneurial history. So there's a couple lessons here, I think, for you and me. You know, if it doesn't work, you just gotta come clean and you gotta get on to your next idea. And that's true whether you're operating a t-shirt company in Berlin or a technology company in the United States, or you're trying to take a drop of blood and somehow get massive testing out of that little drop of blood, which would have been a great discovery and a great service to anybody who's had to go through a blood test if it was true. But they were never able to pull it off despite hundreds of millions of dollars, apparently, of investment and all that research. They were never able to pull it off, but they never came clean. And they had national uh, uh, drugstore chains that wanted to put the machines in there that cut deals with them that were embarrassed because it didn't happen. And they ended up embarrassing a lot of people on their board, embarrassing a lot of investors who get questions from people. What the hell were you thinking? Didn't you see this? How did you get so convinced? Did you miss this? Did she dupe you? You're a seasoned venture capitalist, dude. How did she dupe you? Those are questions that no investor wants, and no professional venture capitalist wants, and no venture firm wants, and no limited partners that have invested in that venture firm want to hear. Nobody does. And so the lesson here is, if it doesn't work, you got to move on. That's lesson number one from the biz doc. And lesson number two is don't stretch the truth. Don't stretch the truth, including when you're sweating it because it hasn't moved and you're now vacillating on moving on. That's a time to move on and also tell the truth. Although Elizabeth Holmes is in court being brought forth by the Securities Exchange Commission and she's not being sued by an investor. Her lawsuit says the people of the United States of America 
versus Elizabeth Holmes. Well, that's what I think about Theranos, but what do you think? Leave a comment down below. I answer as many as I can. And while you're there, hit the bell and subscribe to Valuetainment so you not only are a subscriber, you get notifications of exciting new case studies when they come out. And if you like this part three, the timeline going up to those jury deliberations, then you'll like this, which is part one of Theranos, and this, which was part two of Theranos, which is the first two case studies that I did over three years ago when this story first broke and we knew that it was an entrepreneur gone bad. Until next time, I'm Tom Ellsworth, the BizDoc, and I hope I left you better than I found you.